We welcome you to another study in faith. Our message today is entitled, The Thief That Robs God, Unbelief. Unbelief is like a thief that robs God of his power in our lives and of his glory through us. Isaiah 53, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And then in this chapter he speaks of the atoning work of Jesus Christ, where he delivers us both from our sins and our sicknesses. And then in verse 4 in the Hebrew we read, Surely he hath borne away our diseases, and carried away our pains, and with his stripes we are healed. Now as Christians, to resign ourselves to a life filled with sickness and disease and pain is to rob Christ of a part of his victory which his suffering and death for you has procured. If he died for your sicknesses as well as your sins, as the scriptures clearly says that he did in Isaiah 53 and Matthew 8:16 and 17, for example, if he died for your sicknesses as well as your sins and to claim only forgiveness of sins, and not healing as far as you are concerned, then that part of his work is in vain on your behalf. Now some people will often argue, well, I don't believe it's God's will to heal all the sick all the time. Well, that's exactly what Isaiah said you would say. In verse 1, Lord, who hath believed our report? What report? The report of what God would provide in the death and the atonement of Jesus Christ. Precisely what he reports in Isaiah 53, the healing of the whole man. He speaks there in that chapter of the healing of the sickness of the body as well as the forgiveness of sins. Now since both are in the same atonement, then not to claim both, not to receive both by faith is to rob Christ of a part of his victory at Calvary. If you do not believe God and accept the atonement for your sins, then you must suffer the consequences yourself. And so with healing, if you refuse to accept the healing of your diseases, the sicknesses and pains he bore away at Calvary, then you're going to have to suffer these things, and as many do, go to a premature grave perhaps. To believe God for only a part of what the atonement procured is to rob Christ of his victory over Satan, at least for that part. It robs him of a part of what his terrible sufferings and agony were designed to procure for you, healing as well as the forgiveness of sins. Lord, who hath believed our report? This is certainly a valid question to be asking the churches today. Why the churches of our day search the scriptures to try to find texts to justify why they're always sick. The church of our day will argue, well, Job and Epaphroditus and Hezekiah got sick. Three men in the Bible suffered sickness, and the unbelieving church builds a sickness theology on this and ignores the fact that they got healed by God. Now, the Bible does not say that some Christians cannot sometimes get sick. That's why he has healing in the atonement. You would need healing in the atonement if sometimes believers did not get sick. Christians from the least to the greatest will defend the false doctrine that sickness is from God and His will for His children. It's a blessing in disguise. They may not know anything else about the Bible, but they can quote from memory so-called proof texts for sickness. I was dealing, for example, with a woman trying to testify to her how God had healed me and share the truth of divine healing with her. And she had the typical denominational approach. I quoted all the passages, and she said, well, she just doesn't believe it's always God's will to heal. And she told me how her sick sister had died. They had prayed for her, anointed her with oil, and she had died. And when I sat and showed her the promises from the Bible, she didn't ask any questions. She didn't seem to have any joy about it. In fact, she acted as if she were sad to learn that all of her sister's suffering was not for God's glory. Well, obviously, with an attitude like that, they couldn't pray the prayer of faith, even though her sister had been anointed with oil and prayed for. They didn't meet the scriptural conditions of James 5. We're told there the prayer of faith will heal the sick, and there's no faith in your prayer when you're not sure it's God's will to heal. Now, where did we ever get the notion that a sick, discouraged, diseased, suffering Christian limping through life glorifies God or advances the truth of the gospel? God can call his children home without the need of a cancer in order to do it. 
Now, we know that most people do not have the message of divine healing coming to them from their churches, and we know that most charismatics do not really have the message of divine healing, but we are laboring to try to show you, my friend, that the Word of God is clear enough. He laid your sicknesses and pains on Jesus Christ, and with His stripes you are healed. You are by faith when you have need to enter into what the atonement provided for you just as you did when you needed forgiveness of sins. Well, some people will ask, why do some fail to get healed if it's in the atonement, even though they're prayed for? Or if the gifts of healing are for today, why don't we just go down and empty all the hospitals? Because we read that Jesus healed all who were sick. Well, now the scriptures contradict such notions. Although Jesus healed all who came by faith and asked for healing, he by no means healed all who were sick. There were more left sick in Palestine than got healed. Just use a little common sense and you'll see that. Faith is necessary, and it's often absent. Sometimes people are prayed for, but they don't have faith, and that's why they're not healed. Or there may be things in their lives that need correcting that we'll point out later. The minister's faith cannot overcome the doubts of the person who needs healing. To ask why aren't all the sick healed that are prayed for, we can turn that around and ask you why aren't all saved that we pray for. Well, the reply would be, on your part, why it takes faith to be saved? Well, what do you think it takes for healing? Hope? Our wish, our desire, no, it takes faith. Some people do not prepare their hearts beforehand to receive the healing. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Now, you're hearing the word of God to develop your faith for healing. Some are not always sure it's God's will because they don't know the word. You must be settled on this. That's why we bring the word of healing and of faith to you in these broadcasts so that when you pray, you can believe you have received, just as Mark eleven twenty four instructs you to believe. So when you come to the place that you quit your doubting and asking questions and wondering if it's God's will, then you can start believing. Now, some have faith at the moment, but if it isn't manifested immediately, then they begin to look at their symptoms and their pains instead of the promises of God, and they lose out and give up their confession of faith. Faith never looks in the mirror. Faith never takes its temperature. Faith never watches the spots to see if they're gone away. Faith says, I'm healed on the basis of the Word of God. Healing is not always instantaneous. Don't judge too soon. The ten lepers, it was not manifested immediately. One, when he saw it was manifested, rushed back to thank Jesus for the healing. The blind man in John 9, Jesus told him to go wash. We read, he went, he washed, and then he came seeing. We have seen case after case where people were healed the moment we prayed, but the manifestation came later. It would not have come later had they doubted that they were healed. God may choose to heal gradually, my friend. He has many methods. Some people don't believe that God has any method but one. Sometimes he does heal instantaneously. But often he reverses the process that took months or years for you to get in that condition by using your organs or your glands or your bodily processes to promote that healing. We've seen this happen more than once. God often has a higher purpose in delaying the answer sometimes. Instantaneous healing most of the time would not be in your best spiritual interest. God would just be condoning the weak level of the faith of the churches of our day. I'll tell you, the church today, when they pray for anything, they pray with about 75% hope, 15% doubt, and 10% faith, even when they're believing anything. Most are praying with 100% unbelief. That's why they never receive a thing. Because when you pray, if it be thy will, about the clear promises of God, that is a prayer of doubt and unbelief. Primarily, God is more interested in raising the level of your faith than merely manifesting some answer to prayer right away. Delay does not mean denial. The delay in the manifestation of the answer doesn't mean God has denied your answer. God has many reasons for delaying the manifestation until later, as we're showing you. Because sometimes illnesses are psychosomatic. They may result from resentments, enmity, an unforgiving spirit, fear, or doubt, or self-pity. And so first, God wants you to accept your healing by faith, and then he works in purging us, leading us out of the wilderness where wrong thoughts and attitudes have taken us, and then healing can come. 
You see, if it came while that inner condition was present, you'd be sick again because the cause would not be removed. God deals with the cause as well as the effect in healing our bodies. An immediate answer would not always solve the deeper problems causing the condition. And so the Spirit of God wants to do a purging in our heart. And as we hold fast to the promise of God after we've claimed healing, then God can do His work in us. Satan can hinder that answer. We see in Daniel 10 that the angel of the Lord was hindered for three weeks in bringing an answer to Daniel. You must enter into the conflict. Break that hold by faith through prayer or even fasting if it's necessary at times. Sometimes, as God showed me supernaturally in a dream, Satan works harder. He fights harder. And so sometimes you're going to have to fight harder and resist more. And so delay does not always mean denial. It may be a trial of your faith that Satan is in there fighting with all of his forces trying to hinder the manifestation of that answer. That's why you should hold fast to your confession of faith without wavering. Hebrews 10.23 Then again, unconfessed sin on the part of the person who needs healing may be the reason there's no manifestation. David said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. An unforgiving spirit can hinder your prayer, according to Mark chapter 11. In James 5, 16, we see that we are to confess our faults one to another that we may be healed. And so if this has caused the sickness, some sin or act of disobedience, that has to be confessed. And so God may allow a temporary affliction of Satan to awaken us because we've gone astray, we've disobeyed him, we've not heeded what he's tried to show us, and so until we correct that and repent of it and change our ways, then the sickness is going to remain. You've got to get rid of whatever would hinder the manifestation of your healing. That is to say, we are to examine our heart if there's any delay in the manifestation. This may be the reason. And then there is the failure to resist symptoms. Christians will begin to confess their symptoms at the first sign of them instead of the Word of God. They will say, oh, I don't feel well, or I think I'm trying to take the flu, or I believe I'm getting a sore throat. That's what they believe in. Or they say, I don't feel like I'll be able to go to the meeting. They defeat themselves before they start. We are to resist symptoms just as we do any other temptation from Satan. Both are his methods of attack upon the Christian. Temptations to sin are his method of attack upon the soul. A symptom or a pain is his method of attack upon the body. Have you believed the report of the Lord that healing is in the atonement? Then don't rob God of his glory and appropriate your full redemption.